When you are faced with a pile of data, you are at square 11. There they are, all those numbers. They could be overwhelming, but fortunately, you've been through 10 squares to get here. You know the theory, the literature, the variables, the hypothesis, the procedure, and every other component of the experiment. Now it's just a matter of putting these numbers within that context. The first thing to do is to verify the type of study conducted. If it was an interview or case study, there should be no numbers, just words. If it was a naturalistic, laboratory, or clinical observation, there could be words and numbers. The words would describe certain behaviors or symptoms, and the numbers would be the results of any diagnostic tests given. You could expect a focus group to produce lots of words and some numbers. If you conducted a survey, there would be lots of variables and lots of numbers. There might also be some words given in response to open-ended questions. For tests and experiments, words are scarce. Variables are limited, but there are lots of numbers. After you are sure the data in front of you matches your type of study, it's time to reduce the data as much as possible. If there are multiple test items, total them into one score. In our case, we'll use total IQ instead of subtest scores, and we'll limit ourselves to only IQ and handedness. Now that we have our data in its smaller form, we can begin to organize the numbers. We build a table of numbers. This organization, called a data table, consolidates the number into a very useful form. Since we have two variables, we could make a two-column table, but let's make three columns. In the first column, we'll put an ID number to identify the subject. In the other columns, we'll put their IQ and handedness. Creating an ID number is easy. We probably did it when we ran the experiment. If we numbered the personal questionnaires, we could use that number. Or we could generate a special number for the occasion. For the IQ column, we simply use the IQ provided by a professional tester. As for handedness, we will have to code the response given by our subjects. Coding is the process of converting words into numbers. We can't put left and right into a data table because the computer won't understand it. We can't do stats on words. So we convert the words into numbers. Obviously, it doesn't matter which characteristic gets which number as long as we're consistent. So we code left as 0 and right as 1. When we're done, we will have three columns and 100 rows. Each row will represent a subject, an entity and each column will represent a variable. With our 3 by 100 data table complete, we will have summarized our entire experiment into a single table. The numbers won't seem so overwhelming now. They are all contained. If we put our data table into a computer spreadsheet, we could have the computer check for errors. A good way to do this is to have the computer count how many scores are in each column. There should be 100 in each. Let's assume the count values were 100, 197. That would indicate something is wrong. Checking, we discovered that there are 100 ID numbers and 100 IQs, but the handedness column only has 97 entries. Before we go back to the original forms, let's do one more error checking task. Get the computer to display the minimum and maximum score for each column. The min and max of ID may not produce any helpful information. But if there is an IQ larger than 200 or smaller than 80, something is wrong. And there should only be zeros and ones in the handedness column. Luckily, our range testing, ranges maximum minus minimum, our range checking showed no additional problems. So we only need to check the forms for any problems in handedness. We find one form that was not properly coded, and two forms where the subjects didn't specify handedness. We make a note to yell at our assistant, who is supposed to check the forms for completeness, and we settle for a data table that has some empty cells. In our next square, we determine what the numbers mean.